Thank you. So I wonder, I, tomorrow night sold out. We got some seats here. Well, that's a small venue. Ah, no, no worries. Um, Maybe uh, on entrepreneurial endeavor number three or so, uh, and I, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll just tell, us, tell the story of where I came from and, and something about how I think. And my goal is that at every thing that I should be talking about, I'm hopeful there's a value in it from your own experience. And I have no problem at any point and would even like it. And at some point tonight, perhaps we'll orchestrate it. I don't know. I, if we end up really just talking and you're interrupting me with questions and we engage with questions or you want an example of something, uh, about a problem that you're facing, and, uh, and I'll try and give you an example of, uh, I'll try and search out when I face similar problems and, and how I dealt with them. Um, so uh, I have always been um, I focused on probably thinking a little bit different than other people. Um, and so it's always, I've always been generating ideas of how I want to, you know, how I want to make things better or different or speak to things that really uh, resonate quite deeply. And that's probably, that's probably one of the key things that, that I think when you, when you think about a business, if it speaks to you on some level where you, you almost feel like you have to do it, because uh, for me, I, my businesses, and there have been multiple businesses, uh, some of them nonprofit and uh, some of them profit, uh, they, uh, they address, uh, there are probably uh, two main goals in my life, and, and, and you'll see uh, consistency in that. They address power imbalance, because it's really frustrating for me when you're sitting there and you seem like you're facing arrogance. And so what that gets me doing is, you know, evil schemes in the best, uh, in the best way. So if I feel like there's a power imbalance, I'm trying to figure out how to route around it. And I'm trying to figure out how to, how to, how to set up a system that's going to redress that power imbalance. And that's one of the things. So if you look at uh, early on, um, I set up heating oil uh, cooperatives uh, through, up and down the East Coast. Uh, and that addressed the power imbalance between consumers of, uh, of heating oil and the salespersons of heating oil. Basically, all we did is we collectively bought and set up contracts to, uh, to uh, collectively buy. And, uh, and I guess I could tell a story about that. Um, early on in uh, 1981, uh, we had set up a heating oil collective uh, through New York Public Interest Research Group, which you, uh, uh, many of you may know. Yes, how many people know NYPIRG? Nobody knows, uh, knows Nyberg. That's, that's, that's uh, interesting. Wow. Ah. Um, and so what we had set up is a collective where we gathered together 139 homes. And I was just coming out of school. And, um, I, and they gave me this job. There were 139 homes signed up to this collective. I didn't start it. Um, and uh, uh, the idea was that we gathered the homes together. And in true collective buying fashion, we just sent out an RFP, a really simple request for proposals to uh, heating oil suppliers. And we said, tell us what wholesale marker you're going to attach your price to and what your markup is going to be. And we got a really good contract, and, uh, and it motored along with very few uh, customers. And then suddenly, uh, soon after I, I got involved there, um, the, the energy crisis hit. It was the early 80s, and uh, suddenly heating oil prices were, were going up. And uh, suddenly, 
I started to notice that, uh, that during the uh, winter time, we were saving 40 cents, and during the summertime, we were saving eight. So the fact that we were doing markup from wholesale started to get me this insight into how the market worked, which is people adjusted their margins, and they, their margins were much higher when people were using more. So, because they didn't want to lose customers in the summertime when they weren't selling anything. So, so now I, I started doing news media articles on this, and the, the news media started to call, and before this, I was in this sleepy little corner and I had one phone line. We got one news media article with one telephone and within about uh, two hours, the executive director of the company had, uh, had uh, gotten another phone line or another two or three phone lines put in and we were, we were just taking phone calls. So now this thing starts to grow and we're getting phone calls in and people are joining the heating oil uh, uh, collective and we're 300 and we're 500 and we're 700. And uh, I started to think, well, really all we are is a sales rep for one supplier. So I decided to go get another supplier. You know, let's just negotiate a contract with another supplier. I'm working off, uh, working off each other. Uh, and so we did and it was 11 cent markup and uh, uh, we signed a contract with another supplier and uh, we got 48 people or something with that other supplier within uh, um, a week or two because we were getting lots of calls. Uh, and, uh, and then he calls me up and he says, well, 11 cent markup really isn't so good. He said, it's really hard for me to make it. Um, he said, uh, I need 19, 20, I don't know, 19 or 20. And I was out on the edge because now all these new people I brought in were going to be eight, 10 cents higher than all the people that I had um, signed up with the other guy. And so I, I thought about fighting him. Um, and saying, no, you can't do that. And then I just decided, well, let's see. This is really, I'm really upset. I was really upset with the guy. And how am I going to route around this? How am I going to, you know, what can I do? And so what we decided to do was say yes to him. Give him his nine cent markup and then go after every single one of those 48 customers and tell them to switch to the other guys. That we were a consumer advocacy organization and we were gonna switch them back. So it kind of was a, a kind of jujitsu move, which is accepting, accepting the challenge and then figuring out what to do with it. And we had a campaign. We called up my good friend. He's a good friend uh, still to this day because I suddenly had staff. You know, I, I had started this thing with nobody and suddenly, yeah, they were hiring staff. Um, and, uh, and he and I started calling people up and saying, you really got to switch to these other guys. We converted 45 out of 48 people in one week. We got them back and the heating oil supplier called up within a week and cried, uncle, he said, I'm sorry, I'll go back to the 11 cents. Um, and he did not, uh, he, he rewrote the contract according to, his initial, uh, according to his initial agreements. I don't think he had a real need for 19 cents, but we had to, to figure out how to face that challenge. And about um, six months later, that guy had a thousand customers with us and I think to this day he is a core supplier for that heating oil collective. Then I made a second mistake in my 20s. Um, I, we were suddenly 3,000 people in this heating oil collective and uh, I 
multiplied our revenue, our expected revenue per year times the number of people that uh, that I expected us to have, or we did have, and I reported to the board that we would earn uh, $300,000 uh, this next year. And But what I didn't do is I didn't figure out that we were only going to get revenue for half the year for the customers. I didn't really get the projections precisely right, and I missed it. So here we were growing 500, 600, 700, 1,000 percent a year, and I was very successful, but I overprojected revenue to my board of directors. And they, there was this strong move in the midst of 800, 1,000 percent growth to fire me because I'd overprojected. I, I weathered it, but worthwhile to know. And it's, it's a real learning from my perspective. And one of the things that my current COO says is if there's bad news, they're hearing it from us first. That's the client's going to hear it from us first. Um, and that's something that, uh, that has sat with me for many years. Um, went off, did a uh, bunches of other entrepreneurial things. Uh, I was frustrated. I, I wanted to, to use the revenue from this heating oil cooperative to set up a, uh, um, a, an, an educational and oral history program because I wanted to connect uh, uh, young people with, uh, with senior citizens and with people of uh, multiple uh, um, races and, uh, and ethnicities and cultures. And, um, uh, and so uh, I had built inside Nyperg this revenue of roughly uh, uh, three, four million dollars a year. And the organization was shrinking. And they just couldn't do with what it is that they, they needed our three, four million dollars. They needed it, and they desperately did. So I wanted to do all this cool stuff. But they really needed to do legacy, so I needed to go off and, and do, my own, uh, do my own gig. So I started a nonprofit, um, Innovative Community Enterprises, and we built a curriculum in critical thinking and listening and uh, um, uh, questioning skills. Um, and uh, uh, built that company to, um, to three or 400 schools um, in New York. And uh, we had uh, uh, questioning and critical thinking curricula, environmental curricula, um, and uh, that company. Uh, did I, maybe I didn't turn this on. Is it on? I don't know. You'll tell me. <laughs> you may miss the whole thing. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, so I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Am I loud enough in any event? OK. OK, well, I don't know. Um, so um, we, I, so we built that company and had these visions of this, uh, this oral history um, engagement of individuals and building this curriculum that would be nationwide and that I could develop into this scalable billion dollar education industry nonprofit that would help solve the, the, the issues between uh, uh, young and old. Um, but I had no clue of how to build a business. We Worked with 400 schools. We could never get beyond 400 schools. We never built a scalable curriculum. We, um, uh, we were struggling. We did fine, but we were struggling. I was struggling to pay myself you know, $30,000 a year or whatever it was in this uh, business. And it, uh, it was completely disillusioning. Um, it was like, OK, I built something. It's pretty exciting, it's fun, but it's nowhere near my vision of what I thought I could create. Um, so um, I left it. 
um, and went off to uh, business school and went off to government school first, did a, a master's in government school, figured I'd meet some interesting people there and maybe come up with some, uh, some uh, entrepreneurial ideas. I was feeling frustrated. I wasn't playing on a stage that felt big enough uh, um, and, and went off and uh, um, I did a business degree. Um, at, uh, so I did the Kennedy School, and then I went off to do a business degree in finance down in, uh, in, uh, at Wharton. And, uh, you know, I thought, okay, <clears throat> I got to figure out how to play on the big stage. You know, I got to figure out how to run a business. I got to figure out what, what kinds of problems. And that's probably the second thing. My mother used to tell me that when I was 10 years old, that I was talking about tradable environmental products and that I was talking about that being the future of the, uh, of <laughs> I know, I know, it's ridiculous. But she, I, you know, she used to say that that's what I was talking about. Ultimately, uh, the concept in my mind isn't necessarily tradable environmental products. It's that our economy should reflect our values. So that if we believe that we want to achieve um, uh, preservation of biodiversity, well, our economy should reward it. And what are the barriers to that? How do you create that? How do you make it real? Um, and that's always been the, the, the sort of thing that, that has kept me up at night and tried to figure out how to do it. And, and, and I think when people talk about sustainability, um, for me, Everybody wants a job that they feel is satisfying, but they want to be paid in a way that they want to be paid. They want to make a living. Uh, and sustainability has to do with making money at something, doing something that you're satisfied with that's enriching uh, for you, that, that speaks to you, more than just you know the environmental piece. So... Uh, this business that I did build and sold, this business that I'm now working on, is not the last business. I know what the next one is going to be. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I have a sense of, you know, basically whenever my life is interrupted, it will be interrupted in the middle. Uh, uh, but that's okay. Um, because I know what the next one's going to be, and I know what the, and I don't know precisely how I'm going to get there, but... I know, that, uh, I know that there are ways to get there. So where am I? Now I'm in business school, and I'm trying to figure out what the heck to do after business school, because I don't think I'm ready to, uh, uh, to start my business. Uh, when I was at the Kennedy School, go back to the Kennedy School, um, I said that one of the things that I'd like to do is build an investment fund in environmental attributes and use that fund to drive the regulatory uh, structure. That was one of my goals. And, and my classmates said, of course, you're insane. Um, how are you going to do that? I kind of said, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. Um, and now I'm in business school, and I have a nonprofit that made me no money. Um, which I'm no longer actively engaged with. It's still running, but I'm no longer actively engaged with it. Um, and I don't really see great future in that nonprofit, and I'm out looking for a job, and nobody's giving me a job because I'm a 39, 40-year-old um, uh, uh, ne'er-do-well. Um, and uh, my cousin calls me up, and he says... Uh, you know, Mike, um, some people are brilliant and some people are simply insane. And you don't know what you are, but at some point, maybe you got to recognize that you might be the second and not the first. And maybe it's time for you to consider getting a job. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and, and these aspirations, they're a little bit 
uh, you know, maybe they are a little bit absurd. Consider the possibility that they're a bit absurd. And uh, consistently, um, I've been articulating these ideas of the way I think things could be or should be. And as I'm speaking to people, I just see the eyes kind of glaze over and somehow I'm not, I'm not speaking a language that's actually working for people. And I'm at a business school and I'm speaking to all these 28, 29 year old kids, applying for a job with them, talking about the future energy reduction economy and how the investment bank is going to make hundreds of millions of dollars in the energy. I was speaking billions, I, I, I believe many billions, still, I, well, still, particularly now, it's, uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, real. Uh, but, um, but they were looking at me like this guy is insane. Um, and I wasn't getting second interviews at all. I wasn't getting any jobs, nothing. And uh, I didn't know what to do. And I'd be going to sleep at night feeling like I'm a lousy provider and really you know, just wondering what it is that I had done wrong um, or what it was about me that wasn't working. Um, and, then, uh, and then my son was born, and my son was born in 1999, and my son had um, a serious heart defect so that, and we knew about it for a month and a half before, and we went around researching all the possibilities because we knew we'd have, a, we'd have to have a heart operation within days. I didn't have any health insurance or I, I did have some health insurance but it wasn't going to cover it. Um, and, uh, and so we were researching heart operations and, um, and he was born and uh, we had to have a four-hour uh, uh, replacement of his interrupted aortic arch and filling in of a couple of a uh, couple of holes in his heart uh, when he was three days old, and here I am, I am three hundred thousand dollars in debt. I don't have a job. Well, not three hundred. I'm exaggerating. All that education, all that credit card. I don't know, maybe it was $140,000 in debt. I didn't have a job, didn't have any pro uh, prospects of getting a job. I was overeducated and I was barely surviving with health insurance and my friends were calling me with interventions. You know, all my business school friends are calling up and saying, <laughs> doing the intervention. What are you gonna do about your health care? What's, what's going on here? Um, and, um, um, and I remember uh, after the operation, which was successful, um, I think he's going to, I think my son, who's now uh, just about to be 12, is uh, going to join me in London uh, next month. We're just going to, got a business trip, he's going to join me. Uh, but uh, um, I, it was Valentine's Day. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. You know, what, what was the matter with me? Uh, and I had a choice. I had a choice to either get angry and bitter and recognize, you know, and just, you know, what is, a, why is all this happening to me? Um, um, or to try to, I, I guess three choices. Uh, choice two would be you're just, wrong, forget it, you're insane, your cousin is right, go get a job. Um, or choice three was to appreciate the support I was getting and try to figure out what little things or big things or whatever it was that I was doing that weren't working. Um, and so that decision came with a note I wrote on Valentine's Day to all my friends just exploring, and we talked about this in that in that last uh, uh, in that last uh, forum that we did, uh, where I wrote my friends and I just started to take a look 
at everything that these individuals in my life had done for me. And I wrote a note of appreciation to all of my friends on Valentine's Day. And the significance of that was that I focused my brain on the kind of support I had around me. I focused on, I began to focus on, hey, what the heck isn't working? And largely it was communication. Um, and I didn't beat myself up completely. It was just, you know, it's not, oh my God, you're horrible. It was more like, hey, what's not working? What are those little, uh, little pieces, the little levers that you could change and alter to make things work? Um, and immediately thereafter, immediately thereafter, uh, Passover in 2000, um, I, uh, no, no, that was 2001. So that would be 2000. So in 2000, I realized, I could start a business. And so I went to a business school friend and I had this idea for a consumer advocacy business. There goes the power imbalance piece. Consumer advocacy business in the, uh, in the heating oil um, arena that we would set up a consumer advocate and it would be owned by the consumers. It would be a profitable mutual uh, fund kind of structure and that this thing would, uh, would be fantastic. And I immediately got a couple of friends and uh, raised $50,000 from one over the course of that summer. And he got a friend in who gave me $115,000 and I was ready to rock in my new consumer advocacy business in, uh, uh, in 2000. Um, I, by Early 2001, very early 2001, I had gone through not $165,000, but more like $250,000 because I was getting these guys to feed me more money, more money, more money when I had no money coming in. Um, and, um, and it wasn't working. There was no money in it. I wasn't, you know, people were, uh, we were making thousands of phone calls and just nobody was picking up on this crazy idea. Uh, so, um, so I realized I needed a revenue model. I needed to figure out something that actually would bring in money. Um, and I discovered that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission had come out with this new rule it was late January, the late January 2001. This new rule said that, uh, that somehow the regions needed to um, reward negative consumption the same way they reward a power plant. So they were saying the concept was, hey, guys, all the states, figure it out. Figure out the rules so that if your energy consumers uh, use less, uh, and at the time, uh, then, then you are rewarding them uh, as if they're a power plant. So that was the, the FERC's uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's order. And this was, yeah, Frank. What they said was, New York, you got to figure it out. New England, you got to figure it out. Jersey, you got to figure it out. So they took all the regions that are under their purview, and they said, you got to figure it out. And so the way that most of them started to figure it out is they said, this building has a meter in it. If we pay power plants to be on at peak moments. We pay them to turn themselves on. Well, it has identically the same impact on the power grid if this building turns things off at that moment. Is that clear? So they allowed them, and the way most of the regions figured it out, is they allowed consumers to uh, to meter their buildings, and if they then turned off their electricity, when they were called on to turn off their electricity, they would get paid. Pretty straightforward. Now I'm thinking, ah, 
revenue model. We actually got a revenue model. So now everybody is going, now uh, we, uh, so this market, New York's market was going to start on May 1st, 2001. And I had no money, had gone through $250,000 or something like that of investors' money, and I owned, uh, I don't know, 70% of nothing, something that was worthless and was hemorrhaging money. Uh, well, he no longer hemorrhaging money. I'd stopped hemorrhaging money, but I'd also had no money for myself. And, um, uh, and so I, it was uh, Passover of 2001. I remember saying to my second cousin, hey, there's this meeting next week up in Albany, I'm going to figure out how to make this thing work, and we're actually going to have a company next week. So basically, I want to go up to this meeting and figure out how to register with the state agency so that we can actually do this stuff. So I went up to Albany, and I, I figured out how to register, went to a meeting of about 15 uh, stakeholders in Albany, figured out how to register, um, and, um, and I went to my friends. So immediately after registering, I went to Stuyvesant Oil, back to the heating oil cooperative, right? It's the guy I had brought three, 4,000 customers to, and I said, Marty, you got to give me a, uh, you got to give me a contract where you turn on your distributed generator when the power grid is under stress. I'll stick a meter in there, and Marty, I promise you, I can pay you. I went back to a pal. And he signed with me. He signed up. And we signed three other customers. We signed Lucent out in, uh, out in New Jersey. We signed a hotel up north. We signed uh, a, a hospital, Victory Memorial. I had four customers. And I was in the market. And I figured out that all I had to do was to meter these guys. I had their commitments. All I had to do was meter these guys, and we might make as much as $125,000 that year. So I had a revenue model, figured out something. And it's really cool, because the way that revenue model worked is I'm going to the guy, and I'm saying, I will stick a $2,000 meter on your facility. You commit to cut back when I call you to cut back, and I will pay you. That's it. So you're paying the customers. State agency covers the $3,000 or you know, three quarters of the $3,000 of the meter, something like that. If it costs me $750, well, I'll take the $750 out of your earnings, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pay you. And it was a 50-50 split. We'll keep 50. You keep 50. Now I got a revenue model. I'm paying my customers. I'm uh, ready to rock. So um, then I, I, I started to install meters. And uh, we had, uh, it's now, we've bid into the market May 1st. And the moment that they call an emergency, we have to be there. We got to be there. Um, otherwise, my company's going to fail. So, um, trying to figure out, I don't know anything about meters. I have no idea. I don't know how to, how to meter a facility, interval, meter, uh, none of this stuff. I have no idea about the technology. I don't even know how to hire an electrician. I, uh, I'm at sea. So, it uh, comes around, I'm doing this in, uh, in, in June. And the weather hasn't gotten hot yet, but I haven't metered the facilities yet. So I'm really scared that they're going to have a call sometime. Now June moves to July, and I still don't have it. Haven't figured it out. August hits, and I've got the meters ordered, and I can't quite figure out how to, how to get the things installed. August 5th. And there is a call from the independent system operator saying you're performing tomorrow, August 6th. You've got to be performing. I don't have the meters in. So I'm still living in Philadelphia. I drive up from 
Philadelphia with my meter because out of my four customers, I got two meters and they're my most lucrative customers. And I, so I'm driving up to stick in the meter into Victory Memorial Hospital. Um, and I get a call from Marty, uh, from Marty's from the person who works with Marty. And he says, um, I, I, I can't get my distributed generator to work. And I need Con Edison down here. I need him down here, but I can't get Con Edison to come down here. So my investors are desperately waiting on the success of this or the failure of this because they've got 280,000 bucks at stake. And, um, um, and it's 35 minutes from the call and I'm going to meter Victory Memorial Hospital and my other big customer is telling me he can't perform. So I've got to figure out how to get Con Edison over to this heating oil supplier and do something with their distributed generator within the next 35 minutes. And I've got to go meter Victory Memorial Hospital. Otherwise, my firm is dead. It's gone. It's done. So uh, I, I called up Con Edison. And I said, uh, we need you. We've got a 45 million gallon heating oil uh, uh, location storage plant. And when I turn on my, I need my distributed generator on. And when I turn my distributed generator on, it's throwing sparks. <laughs> so we need you down here. We need you down here. We need you down here quick. And so within like eight minutes, these guys are down at, at, uh, at uh, uh, Stuyvesant Oil, and they're fixing his generator while I'm sitting there screwing in the meter at Victory Memorial <laughs> Hospital, and, um, and we performed. And that day, we booked $125,000 of revenue for our first year. And, <laughs> and that was, and I remember calling up the investors that night. And that night, I pitched them. I said, OK, what we need is another $50,000, and I'm hiring a salesman. You know, we made it. We did it. I told them the story, you know, because they were, they were kind of into the story, uh, the, the drama of it, which probably didn't make them feel any safer about their investment. <laughs> But, but, you know, they were, they were also friends, too. Um, and, uh, well, they were friends while it went well. Um, <laughs> when, they felt, when they were pumping $15,000 a week in, uh, they were a little, uh, the pressure got a little high. Uh, but um, but then, then we, thought we hired a salesman. And who was the salesman that we hired but my second cousin? The guy at uh, Passover who wanted to get the heck out of his current job. And he was living in Brooklyn. And I was using his place as my office uh, uh, location. And uh, so we hired him as, uh, as our first salesperson. Um, and so that was startup phase. Startup to profitability. Because at $125,000 the next year, we had revenue of $600,000. Uh, we were profitable. And it was at that point that I decided I could actually pay myself more than my $45,000 a year that I had been making with the firm. So that's kind of early stage on the company. Um, then we operated for about four years profitably, grew about four, five, six hundred percent every year. We're doing about $12 million of revenue. Um, we had 35 people. We were profitable. We had uh, uh, bunches of challenges in there. And uh, you know, another fire drill to iron out about $2 million of loss um, in a, a couple of months, which we did. So we had some real challenges along the way to remain profitable, but we did. And by the way, key message there in that process is keep your eye on the cash flow. Um, when you got some, so, so early investors, they said no because 
customers were not adopting. They said, you know what, I'll invest when somebody wants to buy what it is that you're selling. Now I have people buying what it is that I'm selling and we're throwing off cash and I feel like we could do anything. Um, and, uh, and then at some point, because I did not keep my eye on the cash flow, we were going to have a loss one year of $2.8 million and I had spent my reserves. So I had to figure out how to iron out a $2.8 million loss in about two months. And that is a critical problem. And at that point, um, I mortgaged my house to the tune of about $600,000 to pay customers. Um, and we ironed it out. In about two months, we figured out, we did a merger, we did an acquisition of a company, we I, I, I won't go into details on that, uh, but we ironed out about $2.8 million of loss in, in one year. Um, and meanwhile, companies that had come in later into the market had raised like $30 million of investment capital and were ready to go public. <laughs> you know, so here I was growing my 400% a year, the first, the first mover in the market, and you know what? It's great to develop profitably early, but you gotta know when the time to capitalize is. And it's a great time to capitalize when you got a profitable business uh, because you got some clout when you got a profitable business. I don't know whether the story will be the same for the next one, who knows, but that's my experience with that one. Uh, so my competitors are, they have like, I don't know, 30, 30 million dollars of dry power, powder, um, and they are going into the market making big splashes. How many people know of the company Enernock? Okay, so we got a couple. How many people know of the company Converge? Okay, a, a couple, but maybe fewer. So now suddenly, Converge and Enernock have come into the market. Both of them have gone public. They started the same business model we were doing after we were doing it. And I was kind of dinkying along at $12 million a year. Yes, we were growing. Uh, but suddenly, these guys are going public. And with their $100 million of revenue, they're passing us by. And the valuations are like 9x revenues because people are just in love with this business model and they're raising money at 9x revenue values and they have a $900 million market cap on, you know, on, on 80, 90 million dollars of revenue um, and suddenly it's, my God, what happened to me? So I went out and I decided I needed to capitalize and I had the choice of either selling to one of these guys, um, and we had offers uh, um, in, or capitalizing. And so I decided to capitalize. And uh, over the next several years, uh, three years, uh, we raised about uh, $33 million of, uh, of uh, capital. We um, grew to about uh, $70 million of revenue. Um, we, uh, we did some debt, we did about $8 million of debt, um, and, uh, and I hired a CEO. One of my key learnings in hiring that CEO was to watch the cash flow, was that his first hire was a chief financial officer. Um, and that was, a very, uh, that was a very wise, bright decision, and he was largely joined at the hip to the uh, chief uh, financial officer. I was doing strategy. I did not want to be CEO uh, because at that time I would not have been, I think, an effective uh, uh, CEO of a company that size. We used the $33 million. We grew to about $70 million, um, and then I made the decision to sell because we were getting a good multiple on revenue. Um, in the end, I probably did about as well, personally, uh, because when you do the venture side of things, um, 
what happens, venture structure, preferred stock structure. Who, uh, who really gets the preferred stock structure? OK, tell me about it. Haha, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so Yeah, and yes, there's the dividend in the preferred stock, and generally the structure in a venture deal is that you get the preferred stock with your dividend, and then the preferred gets to uh, 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 participate in the remainder pro rata. So they're taking their money twice. Now, some of them have that structure. Some of them don't have that structure. It's a structure to uh, at least consider with, uh, uh, with your eyes open when you uh, engage there. But basically, I did about as well. Either way, the venture firms did, uh, uh, they did 2x on their, uh, on their money. Um, and I did about as well if I, uh, you know, afterward. But I was going for the big home run um, and thought that, uh, that I could complete that big home run. We did quite well. And it's probably, interestingly, um, Converge was up at about a $600 million value. Enernoc was up at about a $900 million value. Um, Enernoc is now doing less than 1x revenues in terms of their valuation. They're valued at about $200 uh, Sixty million dollars, and they're doing about 270, 280 of revenue. Converge is doing about 100 million dollars in revenue, and they are valued 38 million dollars as a firm today. So the multiples at that time, which were pushing 2x, now are way down. So uh, we probably did the right thing because when we started this business, we were the only company in that business. And now there are 70 companies in that business and only several viable companies in that business. Um, and, uh, um, and it's questionable where that, where that industry can go. Mm -hmm.